We'll be reading from Psalm 33, the 33rd Psalm, beginning in verse 1. Psalm 33, beginning in verse 1. Of course, we're continuing our thought on a national theme since this is Independence Day. They call it the birthday of our country. And there's about several holidays that cause us to be more uh, focused toward our identity as a nation. In this passage of Scripture, there's a particular verse that a lot of times is quoted in reference to the United States. And we'll zero in on that verse, but also look at some specifics and put the whole verse into context. But I'm glad that you came. This is, of course, the 4th of July. I know a lot of people have cookouts and picnics, a lot of things going on today, but you're back in church. I know we have some people on the live stream. And of course, we appreciate that. And uh, I'm glad that uh, you chose to be in the Lord's house And I'm convinced God will honor you for the effort you make to come and be with us this evening. The 33rd Psalm, beginning in verse 1, would you stand as the scriptures read? Psalms 33, verse 1. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make melody to him with the instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the water of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let the inhabitants of the earth stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the people of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people he has chosen as his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. No king is saved by a multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him and on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. Let's pray together, please. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word as it applies to our country. And Father, we ask as we come together as your children, your people, the people called by your name, that Father, we would take these things to heart. And Father, these things would help us to actually live like people of your name and proudly proclaim your name to those around us. Father, we ask that you would just bless our country. We ask that you would bless our leaders with leadership and direction from you. Father, that you would just uh, give them wisdom, your wisdom, to make right decisions and correct wrong thinking in our high places in our country. Father, we know that our country stands only because of your mercy, of your strength, of your guiding hand. And despite the sins of our country, we plead with you, Father, to protect our country, and as your people, on speaking terms with you, help us, Father, to always intercede and always reach out to those who are not in your family. Help us to be your missionaries and your messengers to a lost world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Verse 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. It's quoted a lot of times in reference to our own nation. Have to understand it was written some about 3,000 years ago. Often with the implication, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord in that there's one country in all the world that can say that this is the God is our, our Lord. That there's just one country, the nation, the nation of God. However, that's not what it says. Any country can be a country that claims God as the Lord. 
However, the determining factor of being a country that is blessed in this way, when it says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the determining factor is not that God, for some reason, has determined to be on our side. But the determining factor is that the people of our country have decided to acknowledge God as God. Uh, I think Abraham Lincoln said it. It's not that God's on our side. It's whether we've decided to be on God's side. Sometimes we like to think that God be, is on our side as we face a world with communism and dictatorships and all the people in the Middle East that want to conspire to kill the United States. God's on our side. The determining factor is whether we're on God's side. And that's the determining factor in this passage of Scripture. The psalm lists some specifics. I mean, it's easy to say, well, of course we're on God's side. We are a godly nation. There's some specifics. These are the specifics that could be met for any people, whether it be a nation or a group of people within a nation that can say, we're blessed because God is our Lord. First of all, what we see is God-directed worship. Worship is exclusively God-directed. This passage of Scripture starts off, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with heart. Sing to Him a new song. Make melody to Him with the instrument of strings. It didn't say just do all these things. The words to Him are mentioned. In that our worship is to be God-directed exclusively. And there's a specific here that you lose in some of the modern translation. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Well, in modern English, you can be singular and you can be plural. However, in the old King James Version, you have the word ye in there. That's Plural. The instructions here, specifically in the original language, are written plural. Now, what does that mean? This passage of Scripture was intended to be read in public in the house of God to God's people. Now, that's the what. Now, here's the so what. Worship is to be exclusively God-directed, watch this, in God's house. And I know people say, oh, you can worship God wherever you are. Yes, you can. Individually, we can worship God wherever we are. But the appointed time to be in God's house, the place to worship God, is in God's house. So let me just say it this way. Now, you don't have to come to church to be a Christian. However... When a country or a people start ignoring church and neglecting church, they are not acknowledging God as their Lord because Jesus Christ shed his blood for this church. God called the house of God his house of prayer in the Old Testament. He looked on his house and the worship as a specific thing. So worship, true worship, is God-directed and in God's house. Now, that's not to say, again, well, I hope that we worship God in all places at all times, and our worship should be God-directed. However, before we can worship God properly, there's a prerequisite. Did you catch that? It says, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for praise from the upright is beautiful. The prerequisite of God-directed worship. If my worship is to be true, first of all, I have to be righteous. A lot of times we see that and say, oh, talking about being holier than thou. All those snooty church people think they're better than everybody else. Well, let's look at what the Bible says about this prerequisite for righteousness. Look in the Psalm chapter 53, verse 3. Psalm 
But we look back at 53, verse 2. God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. Every one of them has gone, turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. Now, wait a minute. It's talking about righteousness and worship from the righteous being proper worship. How then can anybody worship God in sincerity and in truth if none of us are righteous? Oh, look back in chapter 32, verse 1 of the book of Psalms. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. At the very end of this, be glad in the, in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous. Shout for joy, all you upright in heart. God directed worship by the righteous and upright in heart at the end of the psalm, the first part of the psalm tells us how to get there, forgiveness. We're not depending on the fact that we're good enough to worship God. We are depending on the fact that God is adequate to forgive us and make us righteous. Now, Paul said it this way over in Philippians. We've read this passage of Scripture before in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. And he's talking about what meant the most to him, but right in the middle of what he was saying is a very important theological truth. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. What things were gained to me, these I count a loss for Christ. Yet indeed I had count all things for loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and do count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. In verse 9 of Philippians 3, listen, and be found in him, not, ha ha not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that is which is through the faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Not having my own righteousness, but that which is through faith in Christ. There it is. There's how we get to the starting point to worship Christ, is our sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ. We become righteous through him. We become upright through him, and then from there... Our worship becomes acceptable to God. God-directed worship is exclusive. If we are to be a nation or a people whose God is the Lord. Secondly, this is important. What happens to make a nation a nation whose God is the Lord? Secondly, God's word is acknowledged as genuine and true. Verse 4, for the word of the Lord is right, and his work is done in truth. The word of the Lord is right. When God's word is deemed as irrelevant, outdated, out of step with the times, doesn't apply anymore, maybe part of it is true, maybe some of it is not, that nation is not a nation whose God is the Lord, period. If I'm going to deny the reality of his work and the genuineness of his word, then I'm denying him. So we realize he gets down to very specific points of his word. Look in verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the water of the sea together in a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Well, let me back up there. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. In other words, the nation whose God is the Lord acknowledges God made the world. Any other explanation of the origin of the world or humanity, any other explanation disqualifies a group of people to say God is the Lord. When we begin to find alternative explanations for the origin of humanity and the origin of the universe other than God made it, then we are not a people whose God is the Lord because we're ignoring the reality of his word because God says in the word, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then he gives some of the details. 
Now, anything less than that is to say this is not true. And if I say this is not true, I'm saying God is not true. And if I'm saying God is not true, God is not my Lord, period. So the nation or the people group who's going to acknowledge God as the Lord says God's word is genuine, God's word is true, and watch this, God's word is permanent. In verse 10, the Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. In verse 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. Counsel of the Lord stands forever. People's opinion comes and goes. You know how many alternative theories of creation there have been for the last thousands of years of people who just want to find another answer? And they've come and they've gone, but the counsel of the Lord stands forever. It is permanent, and God's word is true whether or not we acknowledge it as true or any other country acknowledges it as true. God's word will never be, as I mentioned this morning, it will never be outvoted. It will never be discarded. It will never be deemed irrelevant. Now, people may say it has no place in their lives, but that does not change the nature of God's word. It just changes their opinion of God's word. And thirdly, God is recognized as the principal source of safety and strength. In verse 16, no king is saved by a multitude of an army. Where do, why, why do we feel safe as Americans? Well, I'll tell you why. We've got the best military in the world. That is a true statement. But there is no king saved by the multitude of an army. Period. What's keeping us safe? God's keeping us safe. We acknowledge that God is recognized the principal source of our safety and strength. We go a little bit further. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. You know why that's in there? That was the most prevalent military weapon of any standing army is a good cavalry. And everybody said, we have the most horses, we can do whatever we want to. And he says, it's a vain thing for safety if you turn your back on God. There is no army that can help you if you turn your back on God. There is no place to go for safety if we ignore and deny and abandon God. God is recognized as the principal source of our safety and strength. God is recognized as being sovereign. He says he brings to naught the counsel of the nations. Why? Because not only does God rule, God overrules. God rules, but for those who deny God, he can overrule. And we realize the word sovereign, I looked it up. That's a, that's a word that we use in theological circles. It means highest in rank and authority. Absolute in power and ability. God is sovereign. So when we say blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, what, what determines that? Well, our worship is God-directed. Well, let me say it this way. There's God-directed worship going on. Is, is there any worship going on at all? And if there is worship going on at all, it is exclusively directed to God. Prerequisite being met, we've acknowledged we are sinners and disqualified from anything righteous outside of Jesus Christ. Blessed is man whose sin is forgiven. We all need that. God's word is acknowledged as genuine and true. And God is recognized as the principal source of our safety. Now, as individuals, I feel like I have amens all over the building to all of this. You say, well, why are you preaching it tonight? God's people are here in the house. I always keep in mind things have changed since last March. We don't know who, who will see this sermon on the Internet. And so we want to be sure, as we talk about our nation, that the position of this church is true and clear. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And when we acknowledge God as the Lord, that is the safety of our nation. 
And the determining factor is not somehow that God's on our side, but that we are on God's side. We've made that decision. Now, the conclusion is the end result. The end result for a nation or a church or a family or an individual is this. Verse 20, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and shield. Now, the word wait here means confident expectation. Now, if somebody says, I'm going to be at a certain place, you go there and wait for me. The determining factor of whether I'm going to go and stay there is how much I believe they're going to show up. Now, I'll wait when I know they're showing up. So to say we are waiting on God means that we do believe God and we have confident expectation he's going to do what he said he's going to do. He's going to do what he said he's going to do. And we're waiting on the Lord. And, of course, he did say, I will be back. So I'm waiting on the Lord. Confident expectation, or we put it this way, hope. Our soul waits for the Lord. He's our help and shield. And our heart shall rejoice in him because we've trusted in his holy name. Hope and joy. And then, of course, this last prayer, let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us as we hope in you. Let your mercy be on us as we hope in you. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. That's my prayer for our country. But who can I control? I can't control Congress. I can't control the why. I can't even control the city council of the quorum court. Who can I control? Me. That's it. So when I'm willing to make God my Lord, then I can make changes in the world around me. Is there anything before we close? Let's stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer.